Welcome to the Economic and Political History Podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas on the intersection of economics, political science, and history. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the Economic and Political History Podcast. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. And today I have the great pleasure of being with Daniel Baldenstrom. He is professor of economics affiliated to the Research Institute of Industrial Economics in Stockholm. And he's the author of Richer and More Equal, A New History of Wealth in the West. This is a book that was published uh, quite recently, just a couple of months ago. And I'm very, very excited of having him uh, here. The book is quite interesting, uh, maybe somewhat controversial, and I'm pretty excited about having the opportunity of discussing it uh, with with him. Daniel, how are you? Hi, Javier. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, well, I'm just fine. I'm, I'm really happy to be on this discussion, and so I'm looking forward to this. So I'm just fine. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And before getting into the book, I I would like to hear more about your your career. You have a very interesting path. And there's something quite curious about your career, which is that you have two PhDs. That sounds a bit insane. Tell me more about how you ended up becoming a scholar interested in economic history and inequality. And for what reason was it necessary to to pursue two, two PhDs? Tell me, tell me about that. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, I know I, I totally agree. It's a little bit insane, and maybe uh, maybe not only a good signal for for everyone who's interested in also being attached to the real world outside of academia. Uh, so the background, I think, uh, so the, the two PhDs, one is in economics. Uh, that's, that was the first one, and the, the second one was in economic history, which is a, a discipline of its own in Europe uh, and in Sweden. So. Whereas in, I think in the U.S. or I know in the U.S. it's more more kind of divided into either the history or the economics department or disciplines. So, so of course it's kind of it signals my interest in in society and history. Um, so using economics to try to sort out what's happening in terms of um, you know I think one of the great great contributions of, of the economic curriculum is the 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 approach to to understanding society by try to model and try to distill the, the basic forces at play and i mean doing this transparently also tells us about what what works and what does not work so even if this kind of the canonical model is not correct that's we are kind of good at being very transparent about it uh so whereas the history part is in fact a very institutional uh institutional thing uh, here we're interested in the you know the in-depth aspects of, of historical development and different historical contexts uh, I think uh, I mean the big I mean some of us some of the economic historians are are, are profoundly interested in certain time periods and and they are they go in depth there and they are more interested in that era maybe historically than they are in the current life in the current era uh, I think my my view of history is I mean, sometimes I've been, you know, too in depth in some some eras, but I think it's more of creating uh, comparability over time to understand where we all are today using the historical as a lens, and to see, and also it gives you so much perspective to compare what was, you know, what was happening then compared to what was happening, what is happening now, uh, and so anyway, so this is where I, you know, how I've tried to continue working on these two kind of series of topics i they're closely related in my in my research uh although then i i wanted to manifest this interest in, in doing a second phd the first one was in stockholm school of economics in sweden the second one was in, in lund university so um but uh well so this is you know basically how i came about to do to do to do these two phds let, let me ask you a bit more on on that then i'm curious about how your environment has fed and, and shaped your your work. So um but there I think two interesting elements about um your agenda and the context. So one, this interest that you have on inequality uh takes place in a period where the subject just booms, right? So the interest for this topic has expanded uh, extensively in the last 
couple of decades when you've been precisely working on it. So I, I, on the one hand, I want to hear about that, your experience working on something that starts to get more attention, not just in academia, but beyond that. Um, but I'm also curious about working on this uh, topic in in Scandinavia, right? So much of your experience is in, in, in Sweden. And, and usually when people think about inequality, they always see Scandinavian countries as this ideal environments, right? And there are these sort of benchmarks for, um, for egalitarian outcomes. And I'm curious about the reception of your work in this, uh, in your your community, right? And in Sweden, and, and I guess that in the other Nordic uh, countries, how has it been uh, working on equality in this context? And and yeah, how, how have you experienced that? Okay, two excellent kind of perspectives and questions, Javier. So as for the first one on, on you know, how I got into this this field, uh, it actually started out when I was uh, at UCLA, right after gra graduating from Stockholm School. Uh, I got a assistant professorship there, uh, closely as attached to the economic history group at the UCLA at that time with Naomi Lamoureux, Jean-Laurent Rosenthal, Ken Sokoloff, and this kind of UC econ history group you had people from davies you had you know peter lindert uh greg clark you had you know a lot of you know upcoming great researchers uh, chris meisner and people around you know santa clara chris michener uh, and and so on so i mean you, it was a great environment to do economic history uh i was you know more interested maybe in financial development stuff at that time um although i felt more and more that you know finance is interesting but it's not you know, the real outcomes. And I felt, you know, the real outcomes, the welfare of people felt more and more important. I mean, uh, and at that time, uh, Emmanuel Serres came to present his work with uh, Wojtek Kopchak on, on the historical evolution of, of wealth inequality in the U.S. It was a paper that came, in, came out in the National Tax Journal in, in 04. And I, I was stunned by the in, enormous attention and interest in his work. and uh, And I was also stunned by you know, really capturing that interest of mine in in understanding real life outcomes and, and welfare of people and welfare differences. So uh, in terms of inequality, but also matching this to the historical analysis. So I felt like, wow, I, I was super excited. And I talked to him and we, and I think, you know, at that time, um, Tuma Piketty was also starting his work uh, and, and I felt, I just, you know, felt that this is what I want to do. So I shifted gears basically at that time. And uh, and I did one of the costlier things, namely to shift, you know, field within within economics. Or it's it's really costly because you have a lot of, you know, connections in your old field. For me, it was like financial history and so on. And doing more econ like income inequality and wealth inequality with a new group, more like public economics people and taxation. So, but I just had to do that. So this is how I got into this. And then I felt that this is, I mean, there's much to do uh, historically. There was basically nothing done in Sweden or the other Nordic countries. So I, you know, started working both in Sweden, but also tried to get data on other countries. So we had a, a handbook chapter in the Handbook of Income Distribution uh, came out in, in 2015, that where we basically collected what we knew at that time about income inequality and wealth inequality. And I was also, you know, early on on, on looking at wealth inequality. Uh, at that time, you know, in the in the inequality literature, almost all attention is about income, uh, which I think is for good reason, by the way. Uh, I think income is the most important, like, economic outcome in terms of capturing welfare of people, you know, guiding us to how, to, how we think about poverty issues. I mean, then wealth is clearly not so useful so but and but when people talked about the rich and looked at high income earners i felt like you know the rich are you know other guys as well you know people owning stuff uh holding companies but and maybe not necessarily having a really high income and yet being you know rich in the in the asset sense which made me want to look at wealth and and of course these things go hand in hand but anyway so this is how i got into so this this uh, uh, study of 
long-term trends in, in, in economic inequality. And of course, as you mentioned, I mean, I was, you know, pure, you know, I was very lucky to be in that field when, you know, it started ge gearing up or ramping up a lot of attention in the surrounding world. I mean, I was lucky to be closely associated with the work or like inspired by the work of Thomas Piketty. And I also, I think, inspired him to improve what he was doing. And, and you know, at the time when, you know, you could hear like, you know, Barack Obama talking about the top percent in, in the, and, you know, you had the Occupy Wall Street and you had, you know, had stuff going on. So that was very exciting. And uh, I was happy to be part of that uh, development, I think. So this, but then, then for the second part of your question, actually working on these issues in Scandinavia, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, uh, is of course a little bit particular. And this is something that you mention or that you note when you go abroad. I think uh, I th I have maybe, maybe opinions about how we do things here up north, uh, how our welfare states function, whether our taxes are 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 really nicely de you know designed, whether our other policies should be improved or and so on. But when you go abroad and maybe if you go into the poorer countries, especially, you notice how you know <laughs> you know you how good these these societies have come to function. And I think it's partly because of you know our politicians, policymakers, but it's also due to other other things. You know how to generate you know the, these institutional qualities that over time, you know, come out from political institutions, democracy, um, the ex expansion of education, and you know the the reforms of the of, of the labor market, being very inclusive, but also to be very you kind know, of growth promoting at the same time. Of course, you know this is crucial. Uh, I think this is something that I think that I try to promote promote a lot in my new book. But anyway, so this is kind of uh, becomes a little bit paradoxical. In fact, so you become very much like a pro welfare state uh, guy going being in other countries whereas in Sweden we can maybe think of you know maybe we should have a much more focus on on, on private sector activities and growth promotion uh so as for you know just to you know mention a little bit about the reception of my work especially my book i have a swedish version of the book which is a little bit extended on 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 onto swedish topics I, I have like some more data on sweden and okay, let me just close, you know, my answer now by saying an, uh, a little bit of like an observation, which I think is partly true also for other countries, but not least for Sweden and the other Nordic countries, namely that in the political debate where you have left and right, left wing people or left wing parties, uh, right wing parties, uh, this kind of peculiar situation when it comes to inequality and inequality debates. So the left wing group is kind of has the advantage of actually understanding that inequality is important. They think that inequality is important, and they understand that this is important to people. Important to people, and it impo it's important to you know how how the how this economy and how society works. The problem is for them that they already know the answer to everything, namely that inequality is too high. So mm -hmm. they and it's actually also going in the right, wrong direction. It's always going in the wrong direction, meaning that they really don't care that much about facts. Uh, so I mean, so in fact, there are fact resistant you could say uh so when we as inequality research want to provide nuances you know you can measure these things in different ways you know annual outcomes multi-year outcomes uh, income versus wealth or disposable income you know labor earnings etc some of these things you know differ in terms of levels or trends but this is totally uninteresting for the left-wing group i mean because they already know that the uh, the inequality is too high. The rich are the problem, uh, you know. And by but you know they're also a solution because they have the money. So let's take their money. So I mean they don't need it. Uh, so I mean you see this all the time, also in the parties and the in their NGOs. I mean Oxfam, you know, looking at their work is is. I mean these are good people wanting to improve the world. Unfortunately, they are stuck in some kind of fact resistant state which I, which I think is so I, I i've offered myself to kind of fact check their their stuff their reports and they don't even answer i mean so the right wing group on the other hand i mean they're totally gone i mean they don't don't they don't even understand that inequality is important i mean uh they have some you know they may say oh we need to look at the equality of opportunity rather than equality of outcome and this is 
about it. So they know nothing about how measurement is done and they really don't care. And they have to totally left, you know, walk over uh, on, on these discussions. Uh, meaning that it, at the end of the day, we have one group who knows the answer, but really don't care about the facts and want to discuss maybe. And the other group doesn't really want to discuss. They don't know anything. I mean, I'm, now I'm a little bit, you know, tough on these groups, uh, but as, a, as an inequality researcher, I feel repeatedly it's quite frustrating. Uh, and um, so, so in Sweden, as, as of now, the leftists haven't really commented a lot on my work, but and there's, there are some right-wing people that think it's important, but because I also talk about wealth creation and so on, so uh, the size of the, of the pie. But uh, so a little bit like a, you know, you know, negative picture a little bit on, on the reception maybe, but in about, you know, the inequality discussions in general. That it's super interesting what you mentioned, and I can relate quite a lot in the sense of how the public public opinion reacts to inequality. I engage actively in this discussions in, in Latin America and and it's it's sort of the case. It's uh it's a topic that has um it seems to me quite um a, a very deep emotional side, maybe. And it's probably part of the things that make it very confusing in the public opinion. I wanna get to that more in, in a bit. I'm actually quite curious about how you think about this uh, more generally. But before that, probably it's uh, it's a good moment to start talking about the argument of, of your book, right? And, mm -hmm. and the way in which you build your, your, your thesis is as uh, a sort of reaction or refinement to an old narrative you call, right? So why don't you tell us what this old narrative is about? Did you relate to the work of 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 Thomas? And what's that view and what's the problem with that view? Why do we need a new view? And I'm gonna ask you more about what this mm. view is in a bit, but for the moment I would like to hear what's uh, what are we who are we discussing with, I guess. So sure. So I mean, so first of all, it's not that old, by the way. It's just maybe 10, 15 years that it has kind of developed, or maybe 20 years. So, so the kind of the predominant narrative in the historical inequality research literature, you may say, which is then, of course, closely related to Thomas Piketty, who has been, you know, a front runner uh, and, and a source of inspiration to, to a lot of people, uh, has been that, so facts have kind of shown throughout the Western world uh, with some nuances, some variation, but actually much less variation that one would might think, is, is that it has become much a much more equal world over the 20th century. So in the beginning of the 20th century, like before World War One, uh, our countries in, in the West were quite unequal, both when it comes to income uh, or wealth or lifespans or you know quality of life in other dimensions. And then, so this is. And then there has been like uh, uh, another literature which is very small and it's, it has a lot of work to do in terms of is that something that was the peak in terms of inequality levels around 1900 or was this the just the old state, the agrarian economy? Was that a very unequal place? So people like Branko Milanovic, Peter Linder, Jeff Williamson, Guido Alfani, um, Jan Leute van Sanden, and, and some others have, have tried or trying to look at this. We are my, my co author, Eric Bengtsson, in, in Lund as well. But anyway, um, the 20th century then, what, you know, what happened was that a lot of things happened uh, in the 20th century. Uh, and what was the kind of predominant, the old narrative, or, or, or you know, that narrative that was associated a lot with Thomas is that shocks to capital occurred, uh, primarily in relation to the two world wars. So capital destruction, both in terms of very physical stuff, bombings or, or you, know, diff you know, different kinds of destruction of capital occurred. And this was the capital that was then held by these rich people. It was very unequally held. And when you destroy that capital, uh, it's the wealth of the rich that is being destroyed. And and then there were taxes coming along both during, I mean, associated with the wars, but especially after the Second World War, that also prevented these pools of capital or these rich to rebuild their wealth, uh, prevented uh, entrepreneurs, I mean, physically or not physically, but you know, through high tax rates, 
but also then preventing them, maybe you know, disincentivizing them from even starting to to accumulate capital. So those kinds of shocks to capital, basically lowering the top, uh, generating equality, was the main story. I mean, Walter Scheidel in Stanford, I mean, has kind of taken that up as one of these horsemen that, you know, these external shocks that, because underlying has been also, and this is something that I also talk a little bit about, is whether, you know, capitalism, capitalism is a is an economic system that gener- is, you know, gen- is generating inequality. It's, it has these capital accumulating forces. I mean, of course, this alludes to also to the work of Karl Marx, in the, in the 19th century, this is also why, of course, the man named his book Capital in the 21st century, clearly referring to, you know, Karl Marx's work. So, and, you know, the story then that the shocks to capital was kind of these forces required to, to, to bound capitalism from being just super unequal. And, uh, and there are like different, you know, quotes saying this. And then what happened was that in the, 70s 80s when or no from the 80s basically when we started re- revising the policies the tax policies primarily uh, that had bounded these capital accumulating forces they were removed i mean the typical two villains here are thatcher and reagan right uh although you know social democrats in france sweden were you know fast to, to really join in on deregulating because you know all our economies had had a large kind of halt or stop in in the 70s when our economies were faltering losing out comp- competitively against uh, the newcomers from asia so the textile industries just vanished the shipbuilding industry vanished car industry you know suffered a lot japanese car manufacturers came along so and we needed to do something. This was quite, I think, well conceived throughout the Western world. And this then created, uh, you know, incentives to do things, you know, taxes were lowered, re- rules were removed. And then we had globalization. We had the political change in 89 when the socialist economists, co- economists, you know, broke down and globalization and technology that's just created opportunity, uh, expanded market size. So this, in a, you know, this was then a policy reversal that set off these or set loose these capital accumulating forces, that has then created a U-turn, a U-shape of the inequality of development. So uh, now leading us almost back towards the 19th century situation, unless we do something. So this is where we're heading, the 19th century. Uh, so. We got help from the wars and the shocks to bound capital, and then we were able to restrain it politically. But then we took away those tools in the uh, in you know policy reverses of the 80s and 90s, and this is then setting loose these uh, forces of accumulation and inequality. This is my at least quite stylized and uh, perhaps a little bit unnuanced view view of the this predominant or previous uh, narrative. Okay, and then. What's wrong with this narrative or why do we need a new one? And what's this new narrative that you propose? And probably a good way of dealing with that is to talk about the three facts that you describe as the as the pillars of, of your of your theory, your narrative, I guess is probably the, the term that uh, is more appropriate based on how you present it. Uh, what's the story then? So what, are we not in this U-shape uh, uh, pattern? Are you're gonna tell me that wars mm-hmm. have not been that important? What, what's what's the story then? How should we actually think about inequality in the West? Mm, yeah, that's. I mean, I think, I think what has been missing in the previous analysis and interpretations is, for one thing, institutions. So, the political and economic institutions laying the foundation for how these economies work and how for, how people work. So. So the, instead of focusing on like mechanical destruction of capital, uh, and I think maybe also some models that are quite um, stylized in in how what what kind of long term or equilibrium conditions are met when when 
guiding you know these big outcomes uh, as like for example the wealth income ratio this aggregate measure i think the economic institutions the political institutions that came in the 20th century was so first of all suffrage like universal suffrage and democracy expanding the the world to not only the elite owning capital in the old era but but to to everyone with being like a citizen in our economies so what what that gave us this came out these reforms came mainly in the 1910s and and maybe early 20s and what they did was was to set loose you know why you know widening property rights uh, they extended education and uh, they also extended labor laws uh, creating better conditions in the in the working place and all of that made workers more productive uh, they got better educated. It was a safer work environment, so they could do a better job and get higher incomes. And this allowed them to start saving. So, and the first thing they started saving for was uh, an own house. So, this of course then required a banking system. So, but then we had banks, and they could provide more mortgages. So what we saw in the what we see in the historical data is is a, is this quite rapid expansion of home ownership rates throughout the Western world from the interwar era and then throughout the 20th century. So and this is then linked to these institutional reforms, including workers for the first time in the productive economy and allowing them to create you know their own wealth and to start building their own wealth and and, and economic reality so that's what and then along with development people started living longer and that also started a new need namely to save for for the old age so in the post-war era we started building up saving for retirement so pension savings and pension system in general uh, were introduced and extended and what this what this shows is that what happened is that the the wealth in society changed shape quite dramatically so from so the and i think i mean it's a very stylized presentation in my work but but looking at just the if you can divide the kinds of the assets that people hold in their portfolios into three types one is ho housing the second is kind of these long term pension savings and the third is all other assets they are typically like other kinds of Industrial shares, corporation, corporate shares could be like a, agrarian land, and there's like plenty of such, such stuff. Anyway, and we could see that the, in the data, and this is actually remarkably similar across the Western world, I think. So in the, around 1900, I mean, 20, you know, housing and pension savings, people's long term savings made up 25% of all assets uh, in the aggregate. But as these the inclusive developments, societal developments came along with people becoming more and more active in saving and building wealth. We see that, you know, the, the, the relative importance of these assets that people hold, you know, the popular wealth has, had, has increased so that today it's 70, you know, from 25 and now it's around 75 or 80 percent of the total wealth in our economies that are, that is, that are made, that is made up of housing wealth and pension wealth. And the rest then, you know, include all these billionaire assets. And of course, some of us are, are as owners in the big corporations that the billionaires command, but uh, through this, the pension savings, uh, the pension funds. So this is uh, from, you know, the wealth growth from below rather than is what actually accounts for this, for this great wealth equalization, as I call it, during the 20th century. So even when we then, we, you know, this is this is such a stark, uh, you know, force of wealth accumulation, wealth growth that it's uh, and that it has not been told much more clearly. I think it's quite quite surprising. So when we look also at wealth growth rates, we see that wealth growth rate uh, in the top is not very very negative. In fact, during the 20th century, it's it's negative. I mean, it depends a little bit on your data, and you maybe start and end years and so on. You can play around a little bit with that. So, Germany, France, yes, the the, the, the top groups took hits and saw this, this you know reduction of their holding, well, absolute wealth holdings. But for most other countries, you didn't see much reduction in wealth ownership among the top. So this is then, of course, the top. In, you know, comparing, you know, the top uh, in different points of time may also be you know, contain different 
people or families or whatever. But anyway, so you didn't see much reduction in wealth in this group. Instead, what you saw was a huge wealth growth in the bottom, which is then what accounts for this wealth equalization. So, and in the post-war era, the top, you know, actually started experiencing higher wealth growth, but it was just smaller than the wealth growth of the rest of the people. So wealth equalization continued. So I think the big story in, in, in wealth inequality analysis in the, over the long run is a one about how institutions started including the masses, educating them, offering them better you know, working places, I mean, through them being part of the democratic system. Uh, so this is, yeah, I can stop there, but I mean, this is, this is the big, I think the big difference in, in, our, in my story versus you know, what has been told before. Let me now ask you, and you already anticipated something that seems quite important in in, in this story, which is the um, data collection and and processing of historical information, right? And so I would like to hear a bit about that. You've like much of the data that you show you have collected it yourself, like throughout your your career. Um, and and I guess my question there is. Well, what are the challenges that come with that and what parts of the data did uh, the whole narrative miss to identify the story that you have been able to identify? Was it the case that they were just not able to see um, home ownership data? Is it housing markets particularly blurry and they just keep this boom of... Um, of estimates of, of wealth inequality with some, how do you perceive that? What dark constraints in the data collection uh, process have uh, have shaped this, uh, this this general view of inequality? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, I mean, just, make, just, just let me be clear. I mean, I actually personally collected, a, you know, a smaller share of all the data that I'm using in the book. So, so the data comes come from many countries. So, I mean, Sweden is, of course, included, and I've been part of, you know, collecting those data. But as for the other countries, this, this is mainly the result of other researchers. And I'm, I'd be, I'd be, I'm happy to, or I'm lucky to know these people. So I, and I'm, you know, follow the kind of the creation of these series over the years. I mean, this is, of course, one, one important part of understanding and also understand what data to use and what not to use. Uh, just that's important. Um, and, and you're right. Uh, and data quality, data comparability are issues that are quite complex and challenging for, for analysis in, uh, like these. So I think in fact, wealth inequality measurement or wealth measurement is much more difficult than income inequality measurement. So, and I, I discussed this in the book and I, I tried also to be clear about this when presenting the work, uh, we should be careful. Uh, there are still some stones unturned. In fact, also for the modern era, I think modern data sets uh, as for wealth inequality, I mean, we have some, most countries don't have good data on wealth inequality, even today. We have some surveys, but they, I mean, for, for a few countries, I mean, we are talking about a few hundreds of observations, uh, I mean, that people still use. So uh, given that, uh, I, so my, my use of the data is to, to see the data, use the data that are comparable within countries over time. So, and then be a little bit more careful about comparing countries uh, in terms of levels uh, next to each other. I do that, mind you, uh, still. So it's difficult, but anyway, so, and actually looking at, for example, at the wealth inequality, trends over time, or now we're talking about top wealth shares, it's it's interesting to see how similar they are in trends, even though, and also levels, even though we have data that in some countries come from wealth tax statistics. So we have a wealth tax, and then the statistical agencies have over the years produced tabulated distribution. So it sells with a certain number of taxpayers and, and the total amount of wealth they hold. And, you know, having this uh, in different cl wealth classes, and then you have, have to estimate wealth total. Uh, in other countries, we have had like probate records, like uh, state tax returns on the, you know, the wealth of the deceased, which is then individual data. You have to make adjustments for mortality across uh, age groups and so on. And you have in others in the third layer of data is 
survey data, like survey of consumer, of consumer finances from the Federal Reserve Board, or Banca d'Italia, Banca d'Espagna have different surveys. So anyway, so all of this is uh, challenging, but still people have thought a lot about making these data comparable over time. Uh, and so that said, when it comes to the perception of these data or the interpretation of the trends and the reasons, the factors, I mean, I think you did, thanks for pointing this out. And I think we should be clear about that. So for example, the, the compositional changes, the you know fantastic evolution of uh, popular wealth, something that Tony Atkinson, Alan Harrison talked about in their famous book from 1978 on, on, the, on the wealth distribution in, in Great Britain. Uh, this, this is also something that Thomas discusses in his capital book. So, so he talks about the transformation of wealth. So it's the, so the numbers are to a large extent there. Why do do we have a shift in the focus on factors or what factors are important? And I I don't know. Um, I think the shocks. Are, I think, for example, when it comes to the role of wars, that was something that we discussed in the like 20 years ago when an understanding and which was also actually pretty new at the time, differences in income in terms of whether it's labor income or capital income. So in the old inequality literature, this is something that we need to remind ourselves about, like the literature that you know was around in the 1990s, 1980s or before, they didn't really care about capital income at all. So they were to almost entirely interested in the labor income. So for them, I mean, this is on the aggregate, we understand that this is motivated because labor income is maybe 90, 95% of total taxable income. Uh, so it's natural to think about income distribution in terms of, of, of like labor outcomes. So capital has, has been neglected or, uh, for many years. And in the 2000s, we started understanding that, wow, capital matters when we look at the top. And it can be very important. And, and we saw that some of the drastic changes in, in capital income happened during the 19th, 20th century along with the wars. So, so then that focus on wars as being important maybe then shifted over also to wealth. Although I think, you know, the capital income is, of course, both the uh, as function of the capital stock, but also the rate of return. So... I think what is new is that, well, maybe the wars were maybe more important for capital income sh shifts rather than wealth shifts, because uh, although, I mean, anyway, so they weren't that, it, it turns out that they weren't that important, in fact. Even when we look at stock market capitalization data, there's a new paper in the Journal of Financial Economics, uh, uh, Zimmerman and Kushinov, uh, looking at the shocks, for example, in on the London Stock Exchange if, during the First World War, which was something that I looked carefully about, where, because... This is one of the reasons why we should maybe could expect this the wealth drop in the UK to be so dramatic as it was in in in, in Thomas and in Gabriel Zygmunt's uh, earlier series. But as, as it turns out, you know the, the stock market cap didn't change a lot uh, between the 1910s and 1920s. It shifted, you know, it jumped down a bit uh, during the war, but it went up again afterwards. So. And there's a paper by Jacob Madsen in, in the Journal of Development Economics, uh, 2019, revising carefully the aggregate wealth estimates of, of Thomas and Gabriel, and I think, you know, calls into question some of the earlier estimates. So there's like, some, to some extent, new data, but, and also maybe a lag in, in focus on, on some of these external factors, but still a lot of the data were in place even Thomas' work and before, when when it comes to the role of housing, for example, uh, in the aggregate, I, I would say, uh, maybe pensions have not been that highlighted uh, as as a specific factor. And in fact, it's a little bit strange because today in many countries like U.S., U.K., Sweden, pension savings or in their funded version. So now we're not talking about pay as ago pensions and in their net present value, but we're talking about actual accounts, funded accounts with people's name on. They account for like half of total financial assets of households, so it's a huge growth, in, in, you know, in holdings. So anyway, uh, and also like finally, do we want to look at the rich as a problem, and to do we want to distribute from them, and you know, looking at them and their relative position as a as a fundamental driver of inequality change guides us potentially 
to that factor. Whereas I think, you know, quantitatively, let's look at the, the, the broad population where people live and, and build wealth and save. So this is, I think, maybe another kind of reason for why our focus differ a little bit. Let me ask you one more question on this um, empirical challenges for gathering data and thinking about the evolution of inequality that you um, mentioned in the book, which is um, the estimates of um, offshore wealth and public sector wealth, right? Which are also regularly, well, the offshore, uh, the uh, offshore wealth is, I guess, part of the narrative, but like it's, it's, it's pl pretty blurry out there, but the discussion on public sector wealth is, uh, in my opinion, also um, a bit uh, underrepresented and probably much more important than what it is discussed regularly. And probably one of the reasons is because of uh, methodological challenges to, to estimate it accurately. So how do you think about those two types of, of wealth and, and what role do they play in, in your story? Yeah, thanks for mentioning this, Javier. I mean, it is really two important topics. I mean, I have one chapter for, for each of them in the book. Uh, as for the offshore wealth, of course, this is like the great fear of all empirical economists, I think, of, of having like missed columns. So that, you know, the outcomes that we look at are not real outcomes, uh, but instead just column shifts. Uh, so like lamppost uh, focus and so on. So, and in fact, I was the early on commented by by some of the big, you know, the most famous economists in Sweden when started looking at when I started looking at wealth inequality by saying basically, no, you can't look at wealth inequality in Sweden. I mean, all the wealth is abroad. I mean, they they don't have, you know, they they don't show showcase their their wealth. So, I mean, you're just gonna have like some phony data. And the challenge then was like, okay, you know, mind you, this is probably you know, maybe correct. Uh, at least we had anecdotal evidence and discussions. Uh, so what, I mean, if we can at least as a starting point say, how big in the aggregate is these offshore holdings? Are they tiny or huge? I mean, and then we can start distributing distributing them to these, you know, the, whole, the, the observed wealth holders in the country. So, and this then was something that I did together with Jesper Oyn, my, my co-author at the time. And we we found that, you know, it could make a difference. And also depending on a little bit on whether we wanted to have people who have, had left the country as also be part of our current population. Like we in Sweden, some we had some very particular cases like Ingvar Kamprad, you know, the IKEA owner. I mean, he his his you know, company is very large and, and having him in or out of the data is actually something that creates a big difference for the top wealth shares. Then in parentheses, we could say that, you know, in fact, he wasn't actually privately owning that company since the mid 80s. He had even, you know, he gave all his shares to a like Dutch foundation, I mean, f forever, you know, taking away the property rights of the shares. But anyway, so and then people have start continued to work on this, like uh, Gabriel Zygman, uh, most famously. I mean, then you know with Annette Alstastete, Nils Johannesen, and so on. So in what I, then, what we I see, you know, using the most recent estimates, we see that yes, there's a skewness in holdings of offshore wealth in the in the domestic distribution. So we see that the domestically rich, using the disclosed data, are disproportionately holders of offshore wealth. So adding offshore wealth, as we can estimate it from different different sources, makes our domestic wealth distribution more unequal. So this is a clear, I think this is a quite undisputable fact. So however, I think what, what the data show is that it doesn't make a big difference. We're, I mean, the genie hardly changes at all. And the top wealth shares they, they grow a little bit. So, it, I mean, what I was interested in for, for my book and my analysis was, does this change the historical narrative? The historical, you know, did I cannot to totally miss out on this? No, it doesn't change it almost at all. Although it's it's not uninteresting as such, and it does make the our, our distribution more unequal. So, so that's at least, you know, my main conclusion as regards the offshore wealth. Going to the public sector wealth, uh, I think the main question that you you allude to is whether how should we think about the wealth that has been building has been building up in the public sector and it's not visible in the private balance sheets. So here, I think pensions is the most important such asset. And now we talk. Now we're 
going into these pay as a go pensions. So the drawing rights on future incomes as to us being labor earners in the economy. And we can see that uh, uh, the, the, the challenge is like, I don't have that income today and I it's, uh, it's nowhere in my account or anything, but it, it's actually, there's a shadow aspect of it, namely I have not saved privately for old age because of this. And I, even I've not been able maybe because I've been taxed. So my taxes go to maybe uh, pensioners today and I'm not able to accumulate privately. And I, but also I don't want to because why should I? Because I will get that income when I get old, at least within the context of stable democratic systems and so on. So, uh, in that context, you know, Martin Feldstein showed in the 70s, uh, you know, that the social security wealth and, and Ed Wolf at New York University has also then looked at this in many works. Does it change the distribution today if we capitalize the wealth of, of, of our future pension incomes and maybe other social security incomes and count it as wealth today? And what they find is that it, it makes a big difference it makes our wealth distributions much more equal. And this is a, uh, is a very large uh, effect, uh, but it's, does it hurt my narrative of our economies being much more equal today than in the past? So we are getting richer and more equal, as the book is called. No, it doesn't hurt it. In fact, it just magnifies it. It makes us even more equal had we had it in the private sector, uh, as opposed to being like in the public sector as, as of now. So this is... Uh, this is my main conclusion on uh, on that. So this is, I mean, it's interesting because in the question that's, you know, there are still papers coming out with Sylvain, Catherine, uh, Max Miller, uh, and you, know, you, have, you have people at the Federal Reserve Board, John Stable House, Alex, uh, Alice, uh, Eric Waltz, and so on. But they all come to the same conclusion. And interestingly, we find almost similar patterns in, in US. In the US, which is like this market economy without much safety, safety net, and in Sweden, which is this social state with the huge taxes and so on. And yet the effect on, on adding social security wealth is kind of almost the same. The genie drops by 25%. Top wealth shares, top 1% shares drops even by half. It's, it's, these are big effects. Let me ask you one final question, getting back to um, well, one of the elements we were discussing early on in, in, in our conversation about how the public opinion embraces this conversations on inequality, right? And uh, even this podcast has experienced that some of the most popular episodes are precisely on inequality. We had Toma here and Branco and Guido, and I'm sure that many, many people are going to be interested in this conversation with you. And my general impression and the comments on, on social media uh, frequently describe how people want to hear a story in which just inequality is too high and it's just increasing permanently and 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 they seem to uh, expect exactly that and I had the impression that what you describe as the old narrative has uh, benefited somehow uh, emphasizing I guess the recent uh, pike in, in, in inequality in the West um, and and I guess my question for you is, well, what what do you think that the public opinion has this appeal for uh, those type of narratives, and and then I want to ask you also what should be then the the policy implications from your narrative, right? So what's the practical approach that you would expect that society should have of your book, right? What can we do? Uh, what can we do with it? So, you know, excellent questions. And I think, uh, I mean, I, I talked a little bit before in our conversation about, you know, though who are interested in, in inequality issues in, 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 I think in general in society, I think this is, and the answer is that this is mainly the left-wing leading people. They are, they care about, you know, reducing poverty. You know, they believe in policy making. Uh, they believe in politicians' abilities to, to improve society. And this is this means, this means that they believe in redistribution. And uh, if they, they think also, they believe in fairness and so on. So there's a lot of strong beliefs and, and many kind of well, I think, motivated sentiments and, and, and so on. So this is, and they, but I, as I also said, I think 
there is some some way of them motivating their interest by having a problem, like criticizing the state of, of, of affairs of, 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 as of now, meaning that they will criticize, they think that inequality is too high. There's, there's something to be done. There is room for political action. And since they believe in it, they will want to have it. Uh, interestingly, this is something that we see, and I haven't, I haven't seen studies of this, but actually I've anecdotally looked at Swedish newspaper comments and discussions in, in you know, as of both, in, you know, to, of today, but also in the 80s. So when we in early 80s in Sweden had an income inequality at its, you know, a global low, maybe historically or maybe even world history low, uh, at Gini coefficients well below 0.2, and yet people were complaining about the gaps, you know, that the redistribution of policies were not effective enough, the rich were you know, pulling off. So there is something about this that I don't understand fully, but I, I see this this uh, kind of dichotomization a little bit. And uh, so therefore I, 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 I wrote a piece in the Aeon magazine, a uh, web magazine, A-E-O-N magazine, uh, on it was called the Great Wealth Wave, where I basically, describe my my narrative and basically all reactions i mean you always get comments from the tales right but i you know i was accused for like being like steven pinker which you know for me it was like i was super super proud to get become you know compared to that guy because he's like a very you know prominent researcher or like dr pangloss of uh voltaire's candid uh you know this guy always portraying everything in the world as from its best uh, you know a little bit state you know, society conserving approach to life and 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 of course very naive so i i can just say that i try to make i make, i try, try to let the data speak uh i think also comparing across countries is very important so i mean you can have a, one single country narrative but when if you have the same patterns for all of these countries also interestingly coming from different contexts and having different institutions and as for the role of wars for example sweden and spain weren't in the even in the world wars and yet they show the same long-term trends as the warfare countries it's a i think one of the arguments against having wars as being very important as inequality generators so but anyway so then then i think letting the data speak as uh, this is basically all i can do and also be open to that new data can come along so this is a little bit Dif difficult and, and uh, actually maybe uh, challenging to marry yourself to a narrative that you get a little bit fact resistant. You don't want new evidence going against it. It's like going, you know, that Tom Kuhn paradigm storyline, right? So you you have anomalies and then you want to explain explain them away and, marry, you know, really defend your narrative. Here, I try to be open-minded and see that, you know, for example, when it comes to wealth income ratios in the 19th century, you know, there's indications of Netherlands, a new paper showing that they're pretty high, higher than maybe UK. Uh, same for Italy. I don't know. This is on ongoing. I'm, I'm super happy, excited to see new papers coming out on this. So I may want to, I may need to also refine my narrative and my explanations in the future. And I actually look forward to that. As for the policy implications, uh, Difficult, of course, as always, and we as as researchers are used to basically say, you know, wave our hands on the one hand, on the other, on the other hand, and so on. Be careful, and I think we should be careful. I think I have a few take takeaway messages, though. One is, I, I want to challenge this zero sum game view of the world. Uh, I think history shows that the rich have become rich, many of, many of them being like successful entrepreneurs, not because they have taken taken stuff from others. But they have created stuff from nothing, uh, new products, services, they created jobs, uh, created tax payments without this even existing before. So uh, the, there is a little bit of tendency of the zero sum game inf influencing people's minds and seeing people having becoming rich as something that has come at the cost of others. If you have that, of course, you don't like successful and rich people. But if you don't, if you, I, so that's, I think... One of my my contributions maybe to help people think a little bit away, go away from that kind of thinking, and the other kind of sets of policy recommendations is to look at policies that promote wealth growth amongst normal people. How to get more inclusive in making people save and build wealth? I mean, owning homes, uh, saving in funded pension schemes, 
Uh, we can think about taxation, taxing people in the in the bottom rather than at the top. And but but in general, creating l l lower gaps by lifting people from the below rather than aiming at the rich and seeing them as a problem. I don't think they are the problem. I think wealth is actually to create is creating values. And what is valuable? I mean, this is something which is we we con continuously refine, right? So Nokia uh, shareholders were super rich in 2000. And now a few years later, I mean, Nokia is back at, at producing Wellingtons and, and car tires. I mean, uh, you know, things change. Blackberries or, or you know, open AI, you know, that company didn't even exist five years ago. I mean, now all of a sudden it's a major player. So there is dyna dynamism and then we can think about, and by the way, another kind of policy implication, which I think is very important when it comes to viewing the rich as potentially a problem, which I hear a lot and I discuss it a little bit in the book, is about power. So this kind of externality of, of wealth inequality that it, we get like screwed political dynamics or we have huge pools of power. Here, I think, look at Sweden or Nordic countries. We have rich people. We have billionaires, even globally, you know, ranked billionaires. And yet, I think many people deem the Swedish system as being one of the most transparent and most democratic, I, I think. And I think it's largely because we have transparency. We have rules against campaign contributions. And, and so we shield off the political sector against private wealth influences. Uh, and the same goes for the media sector. We have private media companies, but we also have a large public sector or public service uh, journalism. Uh, we have support for smaller media. So instead of viewing you know, richness uh, as a problem as such because of power or influences on media, let's, let's have the entrepreneurs do their thing and create their wealth. And, sh and also, but then instead solve the problems on the, on the political side, so to shield off politicians from wealthy influencers or uh, to create more transparency in how people are elected into the political system. So fix the political part and let the business side, the private sector, create and generate the wealth that is kind of creating jobs and tax revenues and so on. That's another kind of very important, I think, message. I think it's something which is in the minds of people who are interested in inequality. They're concerned about power problems. Yes. I mean, in some countries, of course, oligarchs in, in Eastern Europe, maybe dictatorships in Africa. But that's precisely, you know, it's a kind of a political problem that we need to look at rather than wealth generation in, among entrepreneurs. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation, a very refreshing one, by the way. Your book as well left mm -hmm. that... Uh, sensation mean uh, conversation that is uh, very dense and, and very emotional as you described so um so thanks a lot for that um thanks for uh taking time to chat with with us uh looking forward to to seeing you to seeing you soon thanks javier thanks for having me on thank you for tuning in today to the economic and political history podcast don't forget to stay connected with us on YouTube and Spotify. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. Feel free to follow me on Twitter at Javier Mejia C and connect with me on LinkedIn. You can find me as Javier Mejia Cubillos. Until next time, stay engaged. Thank you and take care.